come before the Lord in prayer, seek the face of God, and ask for his blessing in our meeting today as we will come to his house. Our gracious Lord and our loving and our eternal heavenly Father, we come into thy presence humbly and reverently. We come, Lord, with awe and wonder, knowing that thou art God and beside thee there is none else. We come the way that thou wast appointed through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come in the merits of the Son of God. We thank thee, Lord, for the access that we have this morning to approach thy holy throne and to make our needs known before thee. We thank thee, Lord, thou knowest all our needs before we even ask. And yet, Yahweh has commanded us to come and ask, and it shall be given. And we come, Lord, this morning and acknowledge that without thee we can do nothing. And how we need the infilling and the power of the Holy Spirit in this meeting to make it profitable in time and for eternity. And we ask you, O Lord, that from the very outset of our gathering, we would know thee as part of our number. We ask you, Lord, that you'll bless this meeting. We ask that the praise will be acceptable unto thee. We ask, O Lord, that the proclamation of thy word would be truth and would be with power. And, O Lord, it would find a resting place in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And, O Lord, that they would be changed when they hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them through this sacred book. We pray for the eldest in this gallery and pray for the youngest. Lord, none are too old or too young to be touched by God. And we ask you, Lord, this morning that thou wilt come and touch the people upon this hill. Lord, as we wait in thy presence, we pray that thou wilt come and change us. We pray for God's people. Give us a more fervent zeal for the things of God. Lord, help us, Lord, to have a greater love for holiness and Christ-likeness. Help us not to walk after the things of this world. But, O oh Lord, I pray that thou wilt help us to have a great 
great confidence in our Saviour this morning. We've been singing, Who can be against us? And we thank thee that none can stand against us when we are standing in Christ. We thank thee nothing can pluck us out of thy hand. And we thank thee, Lord, for the security we have this morning. And when Satan would come and whisper, Are you really saved? We thank you, Lord, we can look to the cross and say, Yes, the work is finished. The work has been completed. And I am represented there in my substitute, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. We pray for those this morning who are backslidden. And yes, they're in God's house, but their heart is far from me. And we pray, Lord, this morning that thou would stir them again. Lord, bring to them their first love. Restore unto them the joy of their salvation. Take away that rebellious spirit among the people of God. And Lord, break them down, we pray. And wrath, remember mercy. And Lord, be pleased to bring them into fellowship again. That, O oh Lord, there may be unity in the house of God. Remember, Lord, those who are not saved. And we thank thee, Lord, that they come to the house of God. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge this is not enough to save their soul. We pray, O oh Lord, that they must come unto Christ. And we pray this morning, Lord, thou wilt draw them. Pray, Lord, that thou wilt draw them after thyself, after the gospel, after the things of God. O oh Lord, may the things of the world be better to their taste. May they see who the devil is for real. May they see the end of their time upon this earth as it really will be if they die in their sin. O oh Lord, take back the scales we pray from off their eyes. Show them the realities of life and death, heaven and hell. And I pray, Lord, you'll bring them through for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember congregation and those who have special needs at this time. Remember those in hospital. Remember those who are recuperating from operations. Those who have to go for tests. Those whose burden is heavy at this time. And Lord, thou knowest. Thou rememberest our freedom. Thou knowest that we are but dust. And we thank thee, Lord, that thou not only knowest these things, but thou dost make provision for them. And Lord, we pray that thou wilt make provision for those whom we love in this congregation. who can't be at the house of God. We pray, O oh Lord, thou wilt strengthen them in their body, but above all, strengthen them in the inner man. O oh Lord, may they know the peace of God that passeth understanding. We pray, O oh Lord, whatever doubts and fears would creep in, they'll look up a little higher and see the Lord upon his throne. Pray for those, Lord, who have great responsibilities and burdens upon their shoulders today. Pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt just bear them up in thy mighty hand, and may they know just the arms of the Lord round about them. Remember those bereaved today. And O oh Lord, there are those who have lost loved ones in the week and the weeks that have gone into eternity. Lord, I know what's their heart today and how their hearts are aching when they look upon the empty chair. They go into the house and it's not the same anymore. And we pray, O oh Lord, that that will be their comfort, that will be their stay, that will be their friend. O oh Lord, we thank thee there's none like the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And we pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt just be a dear friend to those in need today and a great saviour to those in sin. Pray, O Lord, to thy people, thou wilt just be a great blessing. O Lord, pour out thy spirit upon us, we ask. Help us not to err today, but help us to proclaim thy truth in the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember our brother McCray, the family circle, Lord, even in vacation at this time. Bless them, we pray. For all who are traveling at this time, Lord, put thy hand upon them, we ask. Give them journeying mercies. Give them a refreshing time. May they remember the Lord's day to keep it holy. And, O Lord, bring them back to fellowship with thy people again here on the hill. For we ask these things in our Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord with 540. 540. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle, ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 540. Let's stand and sing. Let's stand to worship the Lord.
Let's turn in the Word of God to the book of Isaiah and the chapter number 22. Isaiah and the chapter number 22. And we'll have our scripture reading from this chapter before we have our announcements for the incoming week. Isaiah chapter 22 and commencing to read at verse number 15. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 22 and verse number 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here? as he that heweth him out a sepulchre and high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hands, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah." And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even, to all the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. Amen. We trust God will add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. We're going to wait upon you for your tithes and offerings, and we're going to turn to hymn number 525. 525 is the offering hymn. Our serve for God has been barren and dry. Barren it shall remain until we are blessed with the fire from on high and the sound of abundance of rain. Let's remain seated for the first few verses of this hymn, 525. <laughs>
Let's turn in God's Word to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7. We're coming to the sixth church that the Lord has written to in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7. Let's hear the Word of God. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7. And to the angel or the minister of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. And hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from or in the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. With God's word open before us, let's seek his face in prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge this morning the great privilege it is for us to come and to read thy precious and holy word. Lord, left to ourselves, we would not know how to worship thee. Left to ourselves, Lord, we would not be able to agree on what the church ought to be, but we thank thee we come to God's word, the one whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and the one whose ways are higher than our ways. And Lord, thou hast told us what we ought to be as thy people. And thou hast told us, Lord, what the church ought to be as thy redeemed bride. And we pray, O Lord, this morning that we will measure ourselves individually and then collectively as a congregation against this description of what Christ desires in the church. And Lord, if there be anything that would be wrong, we will confess it, we will put it onto the blood. O oh Lord, our desire is that we would be like thee. We would be that which is pleasing to God. We would be that which is a testimony upon this earth that there is a God and Jehovah is his name. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt help us ever to proclaim from this congregation that there is salvation through the blood of the Lamb. And I pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt help us, Lord, to be faithful to what thou hast called us to be. Lord, help us not to look or compare with other people or other churches, but Lord, help us to come to the word. This is thy standard. And Lord, we desire to be what thou hast called us to be. And therefore, Lord, come and change us this morning. Make us more like our Savior. Make this the place of blessing upon earth, the place where God abides, the people among whom God dwells. Lord, nothing else will satisfy. Nothing else, Lord, will do in this wicked and evil generation. But we need the Lord among us. And we need to be found in the Lord. And therefore, I pray you will bless us, Lord. We come to thy word. And no man can preach the gospel. And no man can open the word of God with any prophet, lest the Lord be with him. And I pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be with me this morning. And empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. And give me the help that I need to deliver thy word faithfully. O Lord, help me to be thy messenger this morning. Help the word to be as a nail in a sure place. And O God, may it be profitable, not only in time, 
but also for eternity. Oh, Lord, come, we pray. Write thy word upon our hearts. We are waiting, Lord. Master, speak. Thy servant heareth. For we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Now, I just want to do a little review of the churches, uh, as I have done at the beginning of every one of these messages. In the first church that was written to in the book of Ephesus, or in the church of Ephesus, the Lord desired a church that was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. In the second church in Smyrna, he desired a faithful church. In the third church, Pergamos, the Lord desired purity of doctrine. In the fourth church, Thyatira, the Lord desired purity of life. In the fifth church, which we looked at over two weeks, the Lord desired spirit filled service. And here in the church at Philadelphia, the thing that really is commended here and the thing that the Lord would desire in his church is a church that keeps his word. A church that keeps his word. It says there in verse number 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And I believe the keeping of the word is found in two different measures. It's essential in the preaching of God's word. We must keep the word in preaching. We must faithfully preach from the word that God has given, the revelation that God has given. We cannot add to it. We cannot take away from it. And we dare not seek to change it. And not only is the word to be kept in preaching, but the word is to be kept in practice. And that involves all of us. That involves each and every one of us. When God's word is preached and when God's word is obeyed and honored in practice, then the church is strengthened. And the world has a holy witness that there is a God that saves and changes and keeps his people. And you know, sometimes there are men and women, boys and girls think, well, I don't really have very much responsibility in my church, or I don't have to do very much, or I'm not in leadership, or I'm not in any authority. What is the point of me being in the church? Here is one thing that the Lord calls you to. It's a very high calling. It's keeping the word, being a holy child of God. If you're a holy child of God in the service this morning, if you're faithful, if you're Christ-like, well, let me tell you, that's something that brings glory and honor to the Lord. It's something that brings blessing to a church, and it's something that will change this wicked world because the Lord looks for those who are keeping his precious word. And you know, if a church isn't preaching the word, and if a church isn't keeping the word, and if people aren't keeping the word, well, then there's no testimony at all. They're a disgrace and a dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ if they truly are saved. And here is the thing that we must remember. We must keep the word of God in preaching, but we must also keep it in practice. You see, there are plenty of people and they will quote the word of God. Maybe a verse here and a verse there. And this is their thing. And they'll always bring out this verse or they'll always bring out this point. But, you know, they don't keep the rest of the book. They don't keep the rest of the word. They're just focusing this one little bit. This book is a whole. This book has been given to us from Genesis Revelation to read, to pray, to keep, to be blessed through. And therefore, as God's people, may it be granted to us that we are a church that keeps the word. How sad it would be if a man or a woman came in to this house without a Bible and left without a Bible and figured, well, don't really need a Bible. That'd be very sad. May the word of God ever be central in our services and the preaching of that word. Well, what exactly does the Lord say to the church? Verse number seven. To the angel or the minister of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, or these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Well, as it always happens at the start of each of these letters, The writer is identified. The writer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And different characteristics or descriptions are given of the writer or the author of the letter. And here we have some in verse number seven. And the first one is this. He that is holy. The Lord Jesus Christ is holy. And you know, I believe that one of the essential elements or reasons this is given in this chapter is to remind them you're to be like Christ. And therefore, here is the one thing that the Lord desires in all people. You see, this is one of the characteristics of God that is essential to the gospel of salvation, the growth of the church, and the grace to live in a Christ-like manner. It's holiness. Whenever a man or woman is striving after holiness and they're following after God, then they will have assurance of salvation. They will be part of the work that builds the church, 
and they will have grace to live in a Christ-like manner. You see, God's holiness is absolute. He can't be more or less holy, but he is complete holiness. And true holiness, true spiritual holiness in a boy or a girl or a man or a woman is a reflection of the character of God. If you're holy, then people see the Lord in your life. And not only that, it is an acknowledgement that God has control over that life. Whenever we're talking about being filled by the Spirit, it simply means that the Spirit has control over us. And if you're living a life of holiness, then you have submitted and yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit. If you as a Christian are contrary to the things of God, if you're causing division, if you as a Christian are disobedient to what God reveals in his word, and you're happy to go on and be arrogant and cause disruption, do you know what that means? That means you're not under the control of the Spirit because the Spirit doesn't cause men or women, boys and girls, to act that way. Child of God, this morning, have you submitted to the control of the Spirit of God? Do you pray every morning, Lord, take control of my life. Left to myself, I'll feel thee. Left to myself, I'll say that which I regret by this evening. I'll do that which I regret by this evening. Even before I get out of bed, Lord, I'll sing grievously. Lord, have control over me. I offer myself completely to thee as a living sacrifice. Lord, use me, fill me, keep me under thy control today. Have you done that? Because it's only when you're in the presence of the Lord and walking with the Lord, you can be under the control of the Spirit of the Lord. First time the word holy is mentioned in Scripture is there in Exodus chapter 3, whenever Moses stood at the burning bush and the Lord said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And you know, Moses had to do something before, before he could stand in the presence of God. Before he could hear God's plan for his life, Moses had to take off his shoes. <coughs> the shoes of Moses, no doubt, in the desert would have been covered in dust. What does that speak to us of? It speaks to us in a pictorial form that we as God's people need to lay aside the things that have contaminated us from the world. He had to take off the shoes that were dirty and filthy with the dust of that earth and set them aside to come into the presence of God. And friend, we just can't run into the presence of God, as it were, out of the world. But it's God's people. We need to pray for a cleansing. We need to pray, Lord, the things I've seen and heard that have been displeasing to thee, take them out of my mind, take them out of my heart. I want to come in to see God, to worship God. I want to come in to hear God's will for my life. And therefore, I'm going to prepare to come in. Lord, prepare my heart to seek thee. Folks, why do we have a prayer meeting before the services? It's not just to have another meeting. It's that God's people can come and prepare their heart to come into the presence of God. Not to sit and chat before a service, but to talk to God. Lord, cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. I acknowledge in this prayer meeting that I can't be of any profit in this meeting, Lord, unless thou art with me. That's why we have the prayer meeting. God, child of God, come to the prayer meeting. Come prepare your heart. Come seek the face of God before you come into the house of God. And I guarantee the Lord will bless you. But not only that, he came in with reverence to the presence of God. But we must consider who God is as we approach him. Because you'll find as you read on in that chapter, I think it's verse number five. He's told to take off his shoes. Verse number six in Exodus chapter three, Moses had his face. And you know why he had his face? Because he knew who God was. And he knew who he was. And friend, it's good for us when we come into the presence of God to think about who God is and to think about who we are. And that gives us humility. That gives us humility. Sometimes we forget we're sinners saved by grace. Sometimes we forget we were plucked from the dunghill. We are plucked from the miry clay. But when you remember these truths and what God has done for us, it gives us humility. It gives us standing. It gives us a Christ-like character. He knew that God was greater than him. And what a sad thing it is whenever a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, saved by the grace of God, forgets that God is greater than they are. Whenever they don't care what God says, whenever they don't care what God has revealed, whenever they don't care about the church of Jesus Christ being united as long as they get their own way, what a sad thing when they forget that God is greater, when they're irreverent in their speech and their conduct, when they simply come to God's house and look upon God's house as a, as a place they can get something out of. What can I get out of that church? Or what can that church offer me? Instead of forgetting, or instead of remembering that we come to the house of God to offer praise to God. It's not what we get out. 
Friends, what we put in is what we do to worship the Lord coming to him. And holiness is one of the characteristics of God that we can display in some measure in our lives. And therefore, we ought to pray for it and strive for it. Secondly, it says there in verse number seven, the Lord is true. And truth is another characteristic that we can display in our lives. The first mention of truth in the Bible is in Genesis 24, 27. And it's whenever Abraham's servant went to find a wife for Isaac. And it says he, he prayed when he found her and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And as he prayed, he thanked God for grace and or mercy, and he thanked God for truth. And then he said, I being in the way, I was in the right place. I was following the word of God. I was going where the spirit of God led me, and the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Now, folks, let's think about that for a wee second. If you are truly striving after God, and you're truly following God's revealed will in your life, it will lead you to the house of the Lord's brethren. It will lead you to a place where God's people dwell, where God's people get together and worship the Lord, not to a place where the Lord is dishonored, not to a place where the things of God are brought down to earthly and worldly standards, but a place where the Lord is high and lifted up and where God's people are encouraged to strive after him in their holiness. That's where the Lord will lead us to. He will always lead us to the house of his people. His people. And he said, I was in the way, or I was in the path, or the road, or the course of life. You see, he was following the Lord, and the Lord led him. You know, the word true is to apply to the Lord Jesus Christ as a true light, as a true bread, as a true vine. You see, there are false lights, there are false bread, there, is false, there are false vines, and there are things which take an appearance of religion but they're not Christ. God's truth, God's word is our guide. And if we're in the word, if we're in the way, if we're following the word, then we'll be led exactly to the place God desires us to be. You know, there's so many people and they want to know God's will for their lives and they're so busy trying to humanly consider what God wants them to do that they neglect reading and studying and obeying the word of God. But this is God's desire. The people that we'd be people of the word and through the daily reading of the word, God will lead his people. Not only that, but truthfulness should be a mark in your life and mine as a believer. We should be true in speech. It's sad to say there's some believers and you couldn't hear a word they say. And that's very sad because we are to be true in our speech. We're to be true in our business, in our business dealings, transactions. We're to be true in God's work. Friend, these aren't negotiable. These are essentials. And the Lord only blesses truthfulness in our lives. And holiness and truth build church. Worldliness and lies destroy a church and discourage a people. Let me ask you, child of God, this morning, what are you? Can your life be used as an encouragement to edify others because you're striving after holiness, you're walking in truth, or you a discourager? And is your life the potential to destroy the church because you're not striving after holiness and you're living in lies? And then it comes on to verse number seven again, and it says, he that hath the key of David. Now, in the passage we read a few moments ago in the service, Isaiah chapter 22, that's where this quote came from. And it said there in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And you'll find in the word of God that over the Hebrew people and the Jewish nation, the Lord had people set up for a temporary time to be the leader or the ruler of that people. Uh, Abraham was the father of the nation. And then we find that um, Moses led that people and Joshua led the people and then David led the people. Samuel for a time led the people. And all these different men were set up to be rulers over the house. In other words, they had the key. They had the authority over the nation to teach the nation the things of God, to lead them in the ways of God. They had responsibility. They had authority. And if they weren't faithful, they were removed. Saul was removed because he was unfaithful. 
There are many people who were given even the privilege of preaching the word and we'll find that they were false shepherds and the Lord said, woe unto them that had the word, that had the key to eternal life, but kept it from the people because he didn't preach the gospel. And here in the passage that we read in Isaiah chapter 22, the Lord is speaking to Shebna and the Lord took Shebna out of his place because Shebna did something that was dishonoring to the Lord. Instead of preaching to the people, instead of being an example to the people, he did that which was dishonoring to the Lord. The Lord took him out and the Lord placed in his stead Eliakim. And he was given that position and he was given that office. But this passage coming now and spoken about in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7 is reminding us that while David had the key and the authority over Israel for a little while, and Moses, etc., and all the others had it for just a little while, the Lord now has the authority over his people, over his church, over those who are saved. In Hebrews chapter 3, um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3 just for a moment and read the first six verses because this explains it very clearly. Hebrews chapter 3 And it says there in Hebrews 3, verse number 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. And then it says, verse number five, Moses verily or truly was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of whose things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And here, the Lord Jesus Christ is contrasted in the book of Hebrews with Moses, who was considered the greatest Old Testament prophet by the Jewish people. Notice it says, Moses was faithful in the house, or among the people. Christ was faithful over it. Notice that Moses was faithful to a people that were given to him. The Lord Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, is faithful to the people whom he has redeemed and saved, washed in his blood, built up by himself. And therefore, what it's saying is, yes, we thank God for those who were there in the past and were faithful But Christ now is faithful over all. This is the one we look to, and he will be the faithful shepherd. He'll be the faithful prophet and priest and king. You see, David was good in his God-appointed role as king, but we have a greater David. And Moses was good as the prophet, but we have a greater Moses. And Aaron was good as a priest, but we have a greater Aaron. You see, the Lord is greater. God sends people to be used as mighty preachers and missionaries, but no matter how great they are or where, There's always one greater, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the abilities and blessings of others in their lives, we ought to give praise to God for. Not only that, but interestingly, in that verse, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, when it talks about having the key upon the shoulder, well, that word key can also be translated in the Hebrew government. And we know what the prophecy is there. The government shall be upon his shoulder. In other words, his government of his people, he will rule his people. He will rule his people with power and they shall prevail and therefore that fits in very clearly as well. Remember the house of David is used in scripture as a type or a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. Those who are saved, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, I suppose the most clear example of that is the story of Mephibosheth. And in the will of the Lord is something I'm going to preach on next Lord's Day evening. But When we think of Mephibosheth, he was outside of the house of David. He was crippled. He was an enemy. He was estranged. He was deprived of all that he had. But David called him and asked him to come before him. And Mephibosheth heard the call and he came before David. He bowed his face to the ground, knowing his unworthiness, knowing that he didn't deserve anything. And then David held forth his hand and he gave him every blessing that there was in being a member of David's family. And that's a beautiful picture reminding us that the greater David is here. 
And he calls out to sinners in this meeting, come before me. Yes, you're crippled. And yes, you're an enemy. Yes, you're outside the family. Yes, you're estranged. Yes, you're deprived of all things spiritual. But come unto me and I will give you salvation. I will give you peace. I will give you rest. I will give you life. I will give you joy. And still today, the Lord reaches out his hand and calls to the Mephibosheths of this world, come, come to the house. Come to the house and enter in to the family. And this picture of someone being over the house and having the key to the house is reflected in the fact that they open and they close doors. And that's what it tells us in verse number seven. And the hymn writer, Andrew Bonner, who wrote many beautiful hymns in her hymn book, also wrote many Bible commentaries. And he said about the key that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had, he said he could open a door and no man could shut it and that's grace he could shut a door and no man could open it and that is sovereignty and this combined grace and sovereignty proclaimed is what the philadelphian church especially needed encouragement on one hand and stimulus on the other to keep pressing on and folks to me that's one of the greatest things that we could read this morning the lord's in control of our circumstances the Lord opens the door. The Lord shuts the door. And while the world might rage against the church of Jesus Christ, it can't be extinguished. It can't be stopped. It can't be put out because the Lord alone opens the door and no man can shut it. It says there in verse number eight, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. What an encouragement for the church of Jesus Christ this morning. What an encouragement to keep pressing on. What a comfort to ministers and to the churches and to the saints that Christ has the keys, the keys of the universe, the keys of life, of death and the grave. He can open and shut at his own gracious pleasure. The keys this morning are in the pierced hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, the world can rage this morning. And governments can make laws. And people can come on radios and spout the biggest pile of nonsense. But you know what? The Lord still will keep the door open. There'll always be a witness. There'll always be a testimony. And thank God when he shuts something, none can open. And thank God for shut doors. Sometimes Christians have prayed for something and the Lord has said no. And then they live the rest of their lives in misery and despondency and bitterness because God has said no to it. And you know what? If we only knew God's reasoning, we'd fall down on our knees and thank the Lord for the shut doors. A shut door is as big an answer as an open door. A closed door is as big an answer as an open door when we're praying for things in our lives. Trust God's will. He knows what's best. He will give to you exactly what you need. And I believe when we get to the end of our lives, we may well give the Lord more praise for the things he held back from us that we wanted and for the things that we asked for. Surely we can look back in our lives and say, well, thank God he didn't give me what I asked for 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Thank God he knows. And we sang the hymn this morning of God before us. God before us, who can be against us? Thank God none can be against us. And then he says here in verse number eight, thou hast a little strength and thou hast kept my word and thou hast not denied my name. Sometimes whenever people are preaching, they seem to give this impression that the Christian must of himself have this inner strength and must of himself have this power to stand and this boldness. And folks, that's nothing to do with the scripture. We are nothing without the Lord. Without him, I can do nothing. The only strength we have is from Christ. The only power that we have is from Christ. And whenever we look at ourselves and see our weakness, Folks, that again is a blessing from God because seeing our weakness ought to cause us to flee to Christ who is our strength. Whenever you read about the Lord being prophesied in the book of Isaiah as a leader of his people, the head over the house of his people, you'll find that he comes to a weak people and he is the strength that helps them and protects them and guards them. He is to be a hiding place from the wind, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He was to feed his flock like a shepherd, to gather the lambs in his arm, to carry them in his bosom, to lead gently those that were with young he was not to brew or break the bruised reed or to quench the smoking flax he was to open the blinded eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison to those who sit in darkness out of the prison house 
to bring the blind by a way that they knew not. He was to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives. He was to be afflicted in all the afflictions of his people, in his love and pity to redeem them, to bear them and carry them. He was to comfort them as one whom his mother comforts. Now, folks, when you listen to what Christ is to be to his people, we're not to be supermen or superwomen in and of our own strength. We are to call on the Lord to fulfill every one of those prophecies. Lord, be my rock. Be my shadow. Lord, be my shepherd. Bind up my broken heart. Lord, do what thou hast said thou art going to do. Thank the Lord for all these promises, for all these truths that the Lord has promised to do. Lead me, Lord. Comfort me. And as we do that, the Lord will fulfill those promises. God knows our weakness. Psalm 103, he remembereth our freedom. He knoweth that we are but dust. The Lord understands the weakness. And friend, God's desire is that in seeing our weakness, we will flee to him for our strength. God's not angry at our weakness, but delighted whenever we acknowledge it and flee to him for a strengthening hand. And I believe that's what they have done because it says there in verse number eight, thou hast kept my word. Friend, they knew the promises of God. They pleaded the promises of God. They sought to obey the word of God. And this was the secret of their faithfulness, the word of God. And then it says, and thou hast not denied my name. You see, there was a faithful stand here. They held to the word and they never denied Christ. Oh, times there were maybe small numbers, but they didn't deny the Savior. Times there was great persecution, but they didn't deny the Lord. There were times there were personal difficulties at home and in the family, but they didn't deny the Lord. Thank the Lord for those who hold to the Lord in all circumstances of life, to those who acknowledge him in the hand of God, and they rest with the comfort and assurance, even in difficult times, that we will stay true to the Lord. They stayed true to the Lord, and the Lord kept before them an open door, a work that would count for time and a work that would count for eternity. And this open door is a motive and provision for them to grow in strength. You see, the more they strived for in the things of God, the more they would be strengthened. And then we come to verse number nine. They are contrasted with the false religions around them. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. You see, there's a people today and they're against the things of God. There are people in this church and you once were against the things of God, but now you come and you delight to be in the house of God. You delight to see the people of God and hear the songs of the Lord. You see, some people or some Bible commentators believe that this specific reference is to the Jewish people. Uh, they say they're Jews. They claim they're of the Lord, but because they're not following Christ, they're not actually true Jews. They're not following. Because if they followed Judaism correctly, they would find that it revealed Christ. But in their blindness, they don't follow what God has revealed even to the Jewish people. And therefore, they are against the things of God. And you'll find that Jews were very much against Christianity at this time. Now, why is this important? Well, some people believe this is a prophecy of a time when many Jewish people will be converted. And being converted, they will come to the church. And where it says there that they will come to worship at thy feet, it simply means they will praise the Lord for this people because they were faithful. And they proved that Christ was real by the lives that they led, by the preaching that they preached, by the conversions that were seen in their lives. And they will acknowledge that they were blind and they were hard and they were bitter in their former days. Other commentators believe it speaks of many different religions and people who were engaged in false religion. And they are get saved by the grace of God and they will come and thank the church for their faithfulness and proclaiming the truth. Surely there's no greater praise or blessing you can have as a church than for a man or woman to say, I thank God for this church because they were faithful. They preached the word. They kept the truth. And folks, this is what we need to pray. And notice what each of these people acknowledged. To know that I have loved thee. That Christ loved the church. You see, this is something that couldn't be denied. 
This is something that couldn't be fought against. God's favor and God's blessing was upon his church. But it was upon the church that kept the word. And folks, we have to be honest and say that in many instances, those places that claim to be churches of Jesus Christ, the blessing of God isn't upon them. Why? Because they're not faithful. They've thrown the word out long ago. And they meet as Christians, but they don't meet as Christians according to the word of God. They certainly don't preach the word of God. And therefore, the blessing of God is not in the church. And therefore, the world thinks the church is a joke. And that's the reason. Because there are men who stand and they deny the very word which they claim to be preachers of. And that's why the world doesn't take notice. But you see, when God blesses a people, it can't be denied. That's why we need to be faithful. That's why we need to show uh, God's love in our lives. And I have to say this as well. In knowing that God loves the church, how, do we, how does the world know that God loves the church? Well, first of all, for its stand and preservation. But there's another way. John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye have loved one for the other. And folks, the greatest testimony that a church can have is not the preacher who shouts the loudest or not the preacher who's the most intelligent. In fact, it's very little to do with the preacher at all. It's when the church loves one another. That can't be denied. And that is a command from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love one another as I have loved you. That was without conditions. That was in spite of what we were. That was love that moved into action. And folks, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye have love one to another. You see, their testimony uh, was a reality to their gospel and their practices because they didn't only preach the word, they lived the word. Have you prayed that the Lord would give you a love? For all that he has allowed to come into your life. A love. It's not your prerogative to pick and choose. But to pray. And to love. Then it says in verse number 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will keep thee. From the hour of temptation. Which shall come upon all the earth. To try them that dwell upon all the earth. Simply the word of my patience. That's simply saying. The word has been kept. My commandments have been kept. And just like Christ patiently endured all that the Father gave him to do, so the church is enduring patiently all that the Lord has asked them to do. And not only have they kept the word of his patience or kept the word of God, but in keeping the word of God, God keeps them. The more you think upon the word, then the more confidence you have in the things of God. And it says there, I also will keep them or thee. There's a beautiful verse in uh, the book of Isaiah and it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And folks, if you trust in God and you stay upon the Lord in your thoughts, then you will know the peace of God. Perfect peace. Peace. Perfect peace in this dark world of sin. The voice of Jesus whispers peace within. Are we close enough to hear the whisper of the Lord? Are we reading the word of God? Are we depending upon the word? And then it says, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. When I looked at that word from, it has many different meanings. It doesn't mean to be delivered from, so you'll not have to face temptation or trial. But rather it means it will keep you from being destroyed in the hour of temptation or trial. The Lord will be with you there. The Lord will stand guard. One of the old Bible commentators said, in other words, My hand, God says, my hand shall remarkably appear and defend thee from the dangers by which others fall and will strengthen thee in proportion to the trial. And sometimes we see people falling. And sometimes there's a fear grips our heart. Well, what about me? Could that happen to me? Folks, if you're in the things of God, if you're walking after Christ, if you're obeying the word of God, then the Lord says he will keep you. Thank God for that. Don't you be depending on yourself, but you look to the Lord to keep you. Notice it says the hour of temptation, the hour of trial. And the Lord comes at times throughout history and certainly near the end of time, the trials and temptations will come. But notice only for an hour, not even for a day. It's a short time. 
It's a limited time. And during that time, the Lord will prove those who are his, those who will stand in the difficult day. And friend, hopefully and prayerfully, each one in this house will know what it is to stand in the things of God because they have been doing that right through. Then when the difficult day comes, it'll be natural just to keep on standing. We are to prove Christ in every circumstance and difficulty. And then we come to verse number 11 that says, Behold, I come quickly. There's not a lot of time. Time is short. Hold that which thou hast. What did they have? They had the Lord's presence. They had the Lord's approval. They had the Lord's word, the Lord's promises. Hold to these brethren, hold to these sisters. And then it says, let that no man take thy crown. Now the crown spoken here is not a crown of royalty. It's not a crown of gold that emperors wore, but it was a floral wreath or garland that were worn by those in ancient times. The people who won the games would have worn this. Those who were conquering generals would have come back from battle wearing this. Those who were brides to be married would have worn this. It was the emblem of victory, of festivity, of joy, an outward and visible rejoicing, delight in what had happened in their lives. And whenever the roses or the laurel wreaths were placed around the head at the time, they were bright and they were radiant in many ways. But after a day or two, they withered in the heat and they faded away and they were thrown onto the trash heap. They only lasted for a little while. But you remember one of the New Testament writers tells us where to strive for the crown of glory that fadeth not away. And folks, that wreath of victory that you wear today as a child of God, walking in the things of God, can be vibrant and full of life and shining for the Lord continually. If you hold fast that what you have, hold fast the presence of God, hold fast the seal of God's approval, hold fast the word of God and the promises of God and the obedience to the word. And in doing that, you will be a testimony to this world that there is joy in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. How does the crown... Uh, be taken away or how can it fall well whenever we trip and tumble in this world our crown falls we lose our joy lose our testimony we lose that which brings delight to our hearts and folks we need to keep looking up that the crown of glory and victory and joy will not fall off our heads our crown is our joy and obedience and purity our service for the master and our blessing in serving others hold fast when we are tempted remember he's able when discouraged, remember he's faithful. When weak, remember he is strong. And by looking to him and depending upon him, your crown will remain and your joy will be full. And then finally, there's a great reward because it says there, to him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out and in no more. And there we have a place in the building of the Lord for all eternity. God is a place for you in his building. He's building a house. And he calls it the house of his salvation. And precious stones are gathered day by day as the Lord saves souls. And for those who are faithful, the Lord will make you a pillar in that building. In other words, you'll have a place of prominence in the streets of glory. And not only that, but the name of the Lord will be your identification. The name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. And I will write upon him my new name. And you will be identified. Today, we're identified by the blood as we look down. As the Lord looks down, he sees the blood and we're identified by that. But thank God when we get to heaven, we'll be identified by the very name of God. The very name of God. Because he has brought us in to his banqueting house. His banner over us has been love. But for all eternity, we'll be with him. I am his and he is mine. Therefore, child of God, church of Jesus Christ, keep the word. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I'm going to finish this morning with hymn 502. 502. Sang this for the first time in our service last Sunday. And many people spoke to me during the week and said that it was a blessing to them. And therefore, we'll sing it again because it fits in perfectly. Called unto holiness. Make it the prayer of your heart. 
as we stand and sing this hymn together, and then we remain standing for prayer. 502. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray you will make this the prayer of our hearts. Make it our battle cry, we pray. Lord, we thank thee that when we're walking in the light of the love of God, when we're obedient to thy word, when we're loving our brethren and sisters in Christ, that, Lord, none can deflate our testimony, none can destroy it. And we pray, O Lord, that as God's people, thou wilt cause us this day to consider our lives. And, Lord, if we be in disobedience to thy will, Lord, help us to get it under the blood. And Lord, stand in the way that God has called us to stand for holiness and for truth and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, you'll bless this church. Make it a shining light in this district, a place where many souls are saved and God's people are drawn closer to thyself. Thank thee for help given this morning. And we do return thee all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.